Thank you. So, Mika, let's start with you. Um, so, how did you start building your Instagram and social media accounts, and what was your intention behind it? Oh, so I started back in 2010. Um, I was a struggling uh, student. You know, I had I was just uh, figuring out, out what, what I wanted to do in life, and I was like going online, researching fashion topics, and then I, I fell into my first fashion blog. That was Kiara Farakni, the blonde salad, if you Who's guys know her. doing so well now. Exactly, so she was my first inspiration. I thought it was really um, interesting to just get a different perspective of street style through real women, which Absolutely. are all in different shapes, all different colors. So I thought it was super inspiring to see people actually putting their lives out for other people to kind of look at. So for me, it was something super interesting just in comparison to just normal fashion on television or just in magazines. It's far more relatable. Exactly. Right? So in comparison to traditional marketing, i.e. TV and magazines, how do you think social media has changed the advertising world? I think um, advertising is just so interesting nowadays because um, you can now actually just target what you want. You can target the perfect influencer for your brand. Absolutely. And I feel, yeah, I feel brands and also creators need to educate themselves with just what the product is because you, you want to really stand behind what you advertise. You just want to be holding a product in the camera and just saying, you know, I like this product. So I like to build long-term strategic pa partnerships with brands where I feel they can benefit me as well as I can benefit them and just kind of have the best um, view for the brands and the partners. Absolutely. Or, or you know, yeah. just even expanding your demographic to exactly. the brand and making sure that all of those things yes. align. Yes. Right? And I also think it's very important that you can actually see the numbers. You can see people actually 100%. interacting with you, um, asking about the products, and you just have like more of a um, engagement with the followers other than like just normal digital media or newspapers. You get yeah. good feedback, so to say. Exactly, because yeah. they're having a conversation with you pretty, pretty much, much, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what do you feel are the key factors of becoming a successful influencer? Oh God, so when I started, there was like no platform. You could not educate yourself on how to become a fashion blogger, how to become a YouTuber. You kind of just had to learn from scratch. So we, as a sense, like if you've been doing it for a longer amount of time, I feel we had the time to actually evolve rather right. than when you start right now, you'd be like just jumping into the pool. So I feel over the years, I got to just really kind of learn what I wanted to do what I wanted to focus on, which channels I found were interesting to me, like Instagram, YouTube, and blogging. Right. So um, I could just kind of build my own brand how I wanted to, and I feel like it just took time to actually build it all up. And, and I'm establish it. Exactly. What so. about in terms of things like, you know, photographing content and having a schedule yes. and sticking to it? It's so, it's so difficult because as uh, Shay said before, people don't really see it as work. Like I know my friends, they came to me, they're like, you're a blogger, like, okay, like, what are you doing on the internet? You know, I come from yeah. a time, I didn't grow up with social media, so, like, I'm, like, a, an 80s kid. So, for me, it was, like, so interesting to see um, how far you can actually reach with social media. Like, what it's become today is so interesting. Like, That's we true. never had that back then. So, no. like, for me, also, um, when I started, I did not get anything. I did a lot of free work for brands because I was so excited. I don't know if some bloggers, you know, when you start out, you're so excited when you get your first product. You're, you're like, oh, my God. That a brand is exactly. noticed. You. And you're so enthusiastic and you're like, oh my God, this brand actually wants to work together with me. And over the years, we've kind of established like a good partnership agreement with a lot of brands where you'd be like, um, I felt for myself, I had to put much more money into becoming a blogger than what I got back at first. So and I had to could invest. Could you explain that a little bit? So yes. what would you invest in? Uh, equipment. First, okay. first and foremost, equipment. I had to have a computer where I could cut videos on. I had to have a good camera, which took now smartphones are pretty good at it, yeah. but back then you had to have like a DSLR, mm -hmm. and I kind of took it from the bigger bloggers. I was like, okay, maybe I want this camera. I want to, you know, have this editing software, blogging, um, hosting. There are so many boring things which actually go into like creating the a lighting, channel. Everything. Exactly. So I feel um, there's a lot of work which goes into it. It's not just like standing in front of a camera and just smiling. I feel like if you're you know, if you do, like, I like to do everything from scratch. Like, I'm, like, the control person. Like, I want to yeah. edit my pictures. I never want anyone to, like, take that away from me. So I, I really like to just stand behind the products, and I feel, yeah, to equipment really is also really, yeah, Absolutely. Important. So how do you collaborate and handle partnerships, and what do you feel like you've learned over the years as being an influencer? Um, I feel, seriously, um, a lot of brands just kind of look at numbers. Um, when I started, you know, when I started to get my first collaborations, I had uh, maybe 30K. Now I'm at close to a million. I've got 900. Congratulations. Now. Thank you very much. Um, so I feel at the starting, people were so interested just in working with me, and um, for me it was 
like brands just came to you to a random. I, they didn't really fit to me. And I had to learn to say no to partnerships which just didn't look good for me or I really didn't stand behind it. And sometimes it's hard. Like when you're self-employed, you, right. you need to you need to pay your rent and you need to do stuff. Exactly. So, so I really like a realistic exactly. balance. Exactly. Yeah, and like I do it full time. I've, I've been doing it for like t about three years full time. But before, I, I found it really hard to say no because I, in the end, in the real world, you know, right. you have your checks and you have to do stuff. But I feel if you really believe and you work hard on it, then you... You know, you evolve, so and eventually say. you get to choose who exactly. you want to work so with. So now you can just, you know, be more free and not really just like crunch to like yeah. start working with the brands just because and take on anything. Exactly. Definitely. <laughs> so where do you see your journey heading and evolving in 2018? Yeah, I apart think from the million <laughs> million mark. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we'll hopefully crack that one soon. But I feel I want to educate people in becoming bloggers. Like I've noticed okay. the shift from people who are like, oh, you have a blog, you have a YouTube, and now everyone's coming to me, they're like, oh my god, what's the best hosting? So I think it's so interesting that right. people are now just interested in creating their own stories. And they come to me and say, you know, like, how can I get started? What do I need to do? And I would tell them you need a lot of time because you, you can't, like, you a lot build of people, I was going to say, like, you can't be, if you want to fully dedicated to do it, you have to literally, it's a 24-7 job. Like, I, uh, I'm like the worst person. Like, it's so hard to turn off because, you know, you have your phone in your hand all the, right. all the time. And you just, it's not even like conscious. You just go for your phone. You check your Instagram. Yeah. Just like any normal person. But um, it's, it's, it's hard to turn off. And sometimes, you know, I have to lecture myself. I'm, I'm, I try to, like, also when I go on holidays, if it's not, like, something for work, I try to, like, really just stay away from my phone and just kind and of enjoy the break. quality time. Yeah. Do you ever have, like, times in the day where you're like, okay, <laughs> it's an hour. I'm not going to touch my phone or my, or my laptop. Oh, it's so hard minute. because everything just comes. You know, I, I check emails. It's like everything is on my phone. So I, I, I try to be like a strategic person and just kind of, you know, just kind of put time set time in the day just to do certain stuff. But I'm kind of all over the place. Like I, I don't have that much structure yeah. in my life, unfortunately. I would love to, but that's fine. That's not. Well, no. Thank you, Mika. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Thanks. So Patrick, let's move on to you. Um, we would love to know what makes a good Instagram story. Instagram story, because um, well. It, it comes down to storytelling. And it's the best tool you have with the new algorithms to gain visibility and gain followers. Instead of looking at the lower number, I look at ways to increase the number. And a story is divided into three parts. I studied uh, English literature. I'm French, Canadian, so I don't speak English very well. I don't speak French very well. Mm -hmm. um, but there are three parts to any story. You have the setup, yes. you have the conflict, and you have the resolution. It's, we, nobody wants to watch conflict, but there's three parts, and I, I look at it as a burger, whereas mm -hmm. it, there's the meat, which is what the story is about, and that's right. gotta be clear, and you got the buns in between. So you have your introduction to the story, you have the meat of your story that should be good and juicy, and you also have the end of your story where you say bye to everybody. Oh, you're good, you're okay. good, yeah. So how do you maintain, you know, the engagement rate of an Instagram story? You got to make it interesting for to make people watch it from beginning to the end. And one of the things I do is I tend to add the blooper reel uh, at the end okay. of the story, but I want to... Fun tactic. People who, who follow my accounts, we share the same story, sometimes it's 40 different accounts. Uh, oh, wow. I own a okay. lot of accounts. Uh, uh, I have staff, but it's it's a lot of work. But to keep people engaged to the story, you, you got to give them value. You got to give them something they either haven't seen before, something they want to see, and it's got to be pertinent to your account. Can you give an example of one of the accounts and what kind of content you would put out on that particular? Uh, on at Paris, uh, I do have an example, and I have a video I think I want to show. Okay. It's it's snow. It's not something we see very often here. I guess. But it's, it's, I'll let the video do the work. And speak for itself. Yeah. Can we get the video, please? Do I have snow in my face? Can, you Can we change the format, please?
Diana is one of my employees, and she kept throwing yeah, snowballs at me. Her aim is really bad, but she kept hitting me, not the phone. And I wanted her to do it. Oh. Oh, <laughs> we didn't get the camera. Here. Poor transition <laughs> that you saw me. I swear to God, I'm not doing it. <laughs> These are the bloopers that people watch to catch it. Provide value, thank you, uh, by showing your city. Unfortunately, I wanted it to show on, on portrait because I shoot everything portrait. Uh, but it's you get the idea. So uh, after watching that, do you feel like special effects really add to the Instagram story and in maintaining that engagement? You want to be as authentic as possible, and one of the key to success on Instagram was not so much uh, the device that people use. It was, it was the people who started using smart home to make photos. Uh, and I use smart home to film everything because uh, one thing I want to touch on is the tools I use to make the stories. Uh, special effects, why add more work to your daily workload? I work seven days a week. So I, I do all my edits mm. on smart phone. I use uh, Splice, it's a free app from GoPro. It's great and I film with two phones if we're gonna touch this, oh, wow. uh, iPhone, it doesn't matter which one they are, but iPhone 10, I got the other iPhone as a wide angle lens on it, uh, and I'm always cutting between the two. Uh, special effects, I'll use hyperlapse on Instagram, I don't even know if it's still available on the store, and I'll use slow-mo on the camera. And that's okay. pretty much it. Yeah, cool. So what value do you feel Instagram Story brings to the brands that you work with? Well, this is the new word of mouth. Uh, I know brands want to have the link to their website or their Instagram, and I, I don't want a link to the Instagram. So you I won't want do a swipe the, up? I, I will do the swipe, do swipe up, up, but the value is not there. The value is in bringing paying customers. One of the things I do, I have a social media marketing business, and we manage client accounts, and one of my clients has a coffee shop in Paris, and he tells me, no more stories. I don't want to have 100 people lining up for brunch on a Saturday. This has an immediate impact. The story you make, the videos you share, this is YouTube 2008, but it reaches people faster, right. quicker, and the impact is immediate. Agreed. So what is your recommended Instagram story length and how many story panels should somebody post? Two minutes and 30 seconds is optimal. One minute is great. So you need to be really ruthless in editing and this one I was not, uh, the video I showed. Uh, you wanna do one minute because you wanna put stories into your, your post, but two minutes and 30 seconds is great. Um, 10 to 12 story panel. Even less is better because who here has, has gone to somebody they follow and they see like a bunch of little dots and you go like, fuck this shit. I'm not, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna watch this. I'm gonna go to the next one. <laughs> Sorry, I, I swear a lot. Uh, uh, but it, it's a question of you wanna keep it short, you wanna keep it entertaining and one minute to two minutes and 30 seconds. But this said, my most watched story was 15 minutes long on Instagram. So oh, the yeah. bunch of little dots, <laughs> but it was, Eiffel Tower was in it, 166,000, that was when it was only up for tw uh, 24 hours, 166,000 people saw the first panel. 
22% watch until the end. That's close to 38,000 people. That's a lot of people that add 15 minutes and I'm getting their attention for 15 minutes. That's long on Instagram, but everything is film landscape and they're watching it like this. But if it's entertaining, if it's good, if it, you provide value, people will watch it, talk in your stories. So you mentioned that you feel like it's going to be another form of YouTube. What do you think of the future of Instagram stories? We have insight now. I think there's more coming down the road, but you can leave your story up for longer than 24 hours. Uh, In terms of the highlight when you add it to when the When you, you add it to your timeline. And some people don't want to add the highlights, but one of the things I notice, uh, I gain, I have 5.5 million followers on all my accounts. I gain 189 to 200,000 new followers every month when people are struggling to gain followers. Highlights and story do help. Uh, it just adds value to your Instagram account. And, and I want to touch something here. Uh, I don't post anything as I go throughout the day. I treat the story as I treat a media post. It's a later gram. Okay. actually take the time to work it, cut it, put it together, and then I share it in one go, so that makes it more like a YouTube video. And people are more interested to just, okay, I'll watch it, because I know there's a story to it, there's something happening. Got it, there's more production value. Very insightful, thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Garrett, we're on to you. All right. So. What was the main intention of you creating your Instagram? You know, you're the, one of the first families to have this effect on the world of traveling around with your babies and your wife. So what brought that on? Uh, we started our Instagram account right after I had left my job. I was working at Snapchat. Oh, wow, okay. Behind a desk, and it was my first time at like a desk job, and it just wasn't the lifestyle I wanted. So I left work, and we didn't know what we wanted to do next in life. And my wife kind of came up with the idea, well, let's take a few months off, go travel the world, and while we're traveling, you can kind of decide what you want the next step in your business life, career life to be. And I'm entrepreneurial enough that when she came up with that idea, I was like, all right, let's travel. While we travel, I'm going to create an Instagram account and a YouTube channel, mm -hmm. and that'll just kind of be my side venture while we travel. Well, then that side venture became very big and popular and, and it became my full-time venture. Yeah. So do you feel like Snapchat had any influence in your next steps? It did quite a bit, both for good and for bad. I think each social media platform has its like strengths and its weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And one of the weaknesses I saw uh, while I was working at Snapchat wasn't necessarily Snapchat's fault, but just kind of how young people were using social media right. because I would see what people were doing and what people were posting, how they were spending their lives. Mm -hmm. And it was just a whole bunch of wasteful, boring nothing. Mm -hmm. And it made me sad. And I decided, I don't want that for me. I don't want that for my kids. And so that's why when we created our social media, it wasn't about staying inside and doing nothing. It was the opposite. It was travel the world, get outside, and do everything. Yeah, carpe diem, seize the day, mm -hmm. or the year, right? For sure. <laughs> Okay, so influencing people has, you know, become in part responsibility for a lot of influencers. How do you, you know, maintain that and, you know, stay, stay as a role model and um, voice your opinion in, in the right way and maintain your voice? Um, that's really important to us. If, if you were to follow our social media closely, we never ever give advice. Like, we won't even tell people, you should travel here or this should be on your bucket list. Like, we try to just live and lead by example. And so Incredible. if you follow us closely, you, you ho will hopefully see like we spend time, like quality time together as a family. Uh, I think it's really unique and rare these days to have a father, I have three kids, and to spend 24 seven with their kids. I, I taught my kids how to swim, we do um, just day in and day out, like we're together on this journey together as a family. And so, yeah, although we're not trying to like preach or give advice to our followers, right. we definitely hope that they learn from our example and uh, most importantly, like our values. Incredible. So with having small children, you know, on your YouTube and your Instagram, do you ever sort of stop and think about whether they 
want to be present on that or if they're ever going to ask questions about it in the, in the future? Yeah, for sure. Uh, we have three kids, a uh, five-year-old girl, three-year-old boy, and a newborn. And we launched an account, an Instagram account for the newborn. And before he was even born, he had 150,000 followers. That's wild. And it was, my wife messaged me when she, we like launched it. And she's like, how many followers do you think he'll get like this first day? She guessed 2,400. I guessed 7,100. And he got the 1,000 or 150,000. They were both way off. Um, but yeah, so there's this weird thing where like our kids have these really large accounts. We just use them. We don't brand or like uh, do any paid deals any on the kids' content. accounts. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just like a daily journal. I take one picture of each of them once a day. We love watching them grow up. That, those accounts are like our treasures to us. But I don't know. I think worst case scenario, if they don't want to be a part of it, then they'll definitely have the right to just shut it down. Best case scenario, I mean, they could definitely fund their college, be their job when they grow up. Like at least that opportunity is there if they want it. Yeah, absolutely. Love that. So how do you set your partnerships, especially knowing that you know, you're going all over the world? Mm -hmm. you know, is, it, is it difficult to maintain, the, maintain those brand relationships, or is it fairly straightforward? No, I think that's the beauty of, uh, of being online and having those relationships. Uh, especially, I, One of the favorite things of what we do is because we're traveling all around the world, mm -hmm. there's such a large variety to the brands that we work with. Sometimes we're at a nice, fancy resort on an island, right. and then sometimes uh, you know, we're at a home rental working with Airbnb, different airlines all around the world. So like, there's just so much variety to what we're able to do because of our traveling lifestyle. Cool. Um, so do you have any new projects or any new destinations that you could share with us? So, I mean, our m most recent project has been birthing a new baby. <laughs> but now that the baby is here. How was that? Here, was your wife super comfortable <laughs> with doing that? I mean. Yeah, no, everything. We, so we put everything on hold. We t went off social media for a while, focused on just spending time together as a family. But baby boy came. He's yeah. healthy. The, my, uh, my wife is healthy. So now that everything's good, we're going to hit the road again. Uh, we, we have no home. We're just okay. in a rental home to have the baby. And then we'll start traveling full time again. And um, the plan for 2018 is to try to find a place to call home. So wow. the plan is we're going to continue to visit a new country once every week, visit about 25 countries so far already on our list for this year. And we'll either find a place to live, or from each country, we'll pick out like decor and inspiration. And, and the, all of that inspiration will then go into our hopefully home. future home this year. Cool. Mm -hmm. So how is it filming with little children? Like, how do you maintain your schedule uh, as well as obviously, you know, caring for them and making sure everything's uh, the, the The content side and like the story side, that part's easy because my kids are super cute. <laughs> yeah, that'll work. Uh, so they make uh, my job easy as far as creating the content. The editing is the tough part. Because I do all the photography, video, and editing myself, mm -hmm. uh, we post once a week on Sundays. And if I'm in a new country, I don't want to like stay inside and edit. I want to like experience exactly. that country. So I do the same thing every week where I just play, play, play. And then Saturday, I realize I have 24 hours before the new video is due. Yeah. And I just stay awake until I finish it. And it's terrible. And then I finish the video, and I love it. And then I do it all again the next week. That's cool. So how do you find the, the right time to, to know when to share uh, content with your audience? Um, as far as like what time we post, like in, yeah, in the day? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, so because our audience is so worldwide, I have to yeah, know weird stats. Challenge? Like I, I do know that at 9 a.m. Eastern time, like 9 a.m. in New York is when the most humans around the world are awake at the same time. So we post okay. then. <laughs> okay. And then we post 12 hours later so that anyone who happened to be asleep during that time, like Australia and Japan usually, mm -hmm. then they get our second post of the day 12 hours later. Cool. So a lot of th thought goes into it. Love that. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Thank you.